Today, Great.com talks with Kathleen Carlucci, who is the museum director at Thomas Edison Center at Menlo Park. If you've not heard of them, their primary focus is to educate the public about Edison, his significant accomplishments, and the impact on modern research and development. Uh, if you're new here to this podcast, please press subscribe on YouTube or in your podcast app because today we're going to learn about one of the most forward-thinking researchers that this planet has ever seen and what we can take and learn from him. Ms. Kathleen, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, I like to start high level uh, before we dive into really the, the meat of the show uh, with Mr. Edison, but for the folks that have never heard of the center, the museum, can you tell us a little bit about just what is the Thomas Edison Center, a bit about the museum and the, the mission that you all have? Absolutely. So we are a historic site. Um, this is where Thomas Edison actually made his most important inventions. And uh, this is where he develops, you know, even more importantly, the concept of modern research and development, you know, a team approach to research. So our mission is, uh, to, we have almost all the same lands that Edison had. We actually have a little bit more and uh, it's moved around a little bit, but we do have the important, I call it like the green, where his main buildings were. Um, the building that I'm in actually was built as a gatehouse in the 1940s, and, uh, but we're right on the foundation um, of the machine shop uh, that was here at Menlo Park, which of course was an integral part of R&D. Mm. So, you know, Thomas Edison comes here and he creates, you know, so many amazing things. And we want to put that history out there. We want to let people know what was accomplished here. Um, you know, what was the drive behind it and really show them how odd we are, but the, about the amazing things that happened here. It really was a uh, ground level approach to changing the way um, invention was done. And so we have many school trips that come here to our museum when, you know, there's not a pandemic going on. Um, we've actually started again. We've got homeschool groups coming, senior groups, uh, travel clubs are coming. We do scout tours. We really, especially for the young people, we want to inspire them and, uh, you know, really, you know, spark, you know, that light of imagination that uh, happened to Thomas Edison as a young child in a small way. You know, I mean, he didn't have all the advantages that a lot of people would assume that he did, but he still took what he had and, you know, created the modern world that we live in today. Yeah. Uh, and that, I was going to ask that. I mean, for someone that's tuning in and they're thinking, I mean, maybe they live under a rock and they hear Thomas Edison thinking like, Isn't, wasn't that like an ex-president or something? Can you <laughs> give us a, uh, uh, just a maybe high level bio of, of who he was and the importance and, and sort of, uh, you've been there, I think 13-ish years. Uh, mm -hmm. Why is he that significant? Well, you know, that's funny because this is one thing that we never have to explain to people. We might have to explain more about him, but in 2019, you know, before the pandemic, we had visitors from every state in the United States and 62 different countries. Mm -hmm. And not one person did I have to say, this is who Thomas Edison is. <laughs> of course, maybe if they're under the age of eight, you know, maybe. Um, but what Thomas Edison does here at Menlo Park is he, he changes the world we live in. He creates a base for centralized electricity and and he just thinks as trite as it might sound he just thinks outside of the box and he thinks why not where others are like oh no there's problems he just like dives after um these problems of his day mm -hmm. which we're still benefiting from today so he was born in uh, Milan, Ohio in uh, 1847 he was the last and the seventh child of Nancy and Samuel Edison and uh, his father did own his own business. He was kind of an entrepreneur in his own right. Not everything was always successful. Um, Edison, though, was uh, very uh, distant in age from his older siblings because um, a number of their children passed away. I mean, childhood disease, lack of medicine and nutrition at that time being what it was. So Edison was almost like an only child in some ways. Um, he was quite sickly himself as a child, and perhaps that's why he had a hearing loss, um, which really does affect him, he thinks, in a positive way, 
because he'll say later on, it enables me to concentrate better. Um, I guess he could ignore what he wanted to and, you know, <laughs> focus on what he wanted to. Um, but his, his mother did enroll him in school, which actually was kind of unusual at that time. Usually people of some means went to school. Others were taught at home, homeschooled, you know, we call it mm. today. And, uh, but he was signed in at seven years old, but he comes home very upset. He had overheard the uh, instructor. It was like a one room schoolhouse type situation um, say that he was uh, incapable of learning and that he was, you know, that the parents would be wasting their money to send him there. But, you know, Mary Edison, she thought differently, you know, mothers know their children. And uh, she said, no, no, I was a school teacher before I was married. And I can tell by the questions my son asked me that he is, he's got a good brain. You know, he's really thinking these through. He's really that kind of person that is paying attention to what's going on around him and really thinking about it, you know, deep thoughts. Mm. Well, his mother does teach him to read very well. And he has a love of reading and learning. Um, he does love literature, but of course we know what's his favorite subject. It's science. You know, this is like, uh, you know, the industrial revolution, like the second coming. And Thomas Edison is enthralled by this device that was invented a few years before his birth called the telegraph. Mm -hmm. So this long distance communication system is exciting to him. And they're basically in the train stations and other offices uh, through the towns, like connecting the country, making the world a, a much smaller place, which is what the internet does for us today. And uh, Thomas Edison uh, loves it. And uh, he also loves science. So his parents really do give him books and make them available to him. And he's conducting science experiments and he has failures. He burns down the family barn, you know, and he does get in quite a bit of trouble for that. But the encouragement doesn't end there. Just like be more careful. Um, the family had moved when he was seven to a much bigger city and he saw so much more happening there. Um, they moved to Port Huron in Michigan and it's a big port town and, you know, boats are coming in. And this is a time when a young boy or young girl for that matter, if they could, um, could look in and see what's happening in, in that shop. Um, he was, uh, seems to be really uh, mesmerized by mechanisms and, and how they work and, and he loves that. He seems to have this uh, you know, intuitive knowledge about them. And so he will do chemical experiments at home, but he, he also reads books that teach him how to build a telegraph. He memorizes Morse code. Um, he builds a telegraph for his friend and they're communicating back and forth. Well, by the age of 12, he tells his mother, well, I think you've taught me everything you know or something of that, you know, ilk. I'm sure that's not true at all. And that's all 12 so year olds do. That's <laughs> oh, exactly. And, um, and so he will ask to get the permission to get a job, which mm. is not at all that unusual at that time. Everybody's doing everything they can to help the family stay as one. I mean, sometimes their family circumstances would be good. And other times they'd be bringing in borders, you know, to help supplement the income. So Edison's, uh, he gets a job working on the Grand Trunk Railroad as a candy butcher. And he's selling newspapers and candy you know, but one thing about him, he's also paying attention to what's happening around him. He notices people are asking for, you know, or talking about how they have to stop and get something for their dinner, you know, or what's the information going on about that, that war happening, the Civil War. And uh, Thomas Edison is, you know, fascinated by this. And he's thinking, how can I fulfill these, these issues? People are hungry. Mother, make some sandwiches. I'll sell them on the train or, you know, our little, you know, truck garden at home. I could sell veggies on the train also. Um, he's actually doing so well. He's making more money than some adult men are. And he hires some friends to work with him. And, you know, then he notices something else. He notices that the um, information that he hears at the telegraph offices at the train depots on the way from his hometown to the big city of Detroit every day, have more up-to-date information on this war going on in the United States and not really that far from you know, where he lives. He's just a young kid, but he decides, you know what, instead of selling these newspapers, 
I'll buy my own printing press and I'll make my own newspaper. And he does that. The first newspaper created on a moving train. Wow. And it's a little bit of a gossip rag, a little bit of a market report on with prices of our, you know, the staples of the time, what's happening in the war, who just had a baby, uh, so on and so forth. And he's making quite a bit of money. Now, at this time, he's known as Al Edison because his middle name is Thomas and then Alva Edison. He was named after his uh, father's good friend, uh, the sea captain. Mm. And young Al um, is printing out his The Weekly Herald, and he's doing pretty well. So on his way to work one day, he sees a little boy playing by the railroad tracks, you know, not at all a safe place to be playing who's, it seems he's trying to catch a bird, we think, at the time. Edison sees the baggage car backing up, and he sees the brakeman on top trying to, you know, furiously, you know, close the brake and, and get it stopped. And Edison makes a split-second decision that will change his life forever. He drops everything in his hands, and he dives out, and he rolls to the other side. The people on the, the train depot side aren't sure, are they dead or not? And so after the train passes, he's on the ground brushing himself off. And this little boy who's, you know, very upset <laughs> and crying, what happened? <laughs> and um, a crowd comes around and Edison, you know, sees, you know, they're congratulating him at a boy. And all of a sudden the station master comes out uh, from the station, Mr. Uh, McKenzie. And he's like, what's going on out here? You know. People were screaming at the time. And uh, they say, well, this kid, you know, like, what's your name, kid? Uh, you know, Al Edison. Uh, yeah, he saved this boy's life. You know, Mr. McKenzie's probably like, Al Edison, isn't that that kid that caused some issues, you know, with fire? But he comes over to see what's going on. And he almost drops to his knees when the crowd parts. Because that's just not some little boy. It was his son mm. that Thomas Edison saved. So immediately, Mr. McKenzie wants to give, you know, young Edison a reward. And uh, he says, no, 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 you can't. I did what anyone should do. And so Mr. McKenzie's like, well, there must be some way, you know, that, you know, you can help me. And Mr. McKenzie did know him because every time Edison was getting off and, you know, picking up newspapers or dropping off packages, helping out, um, he would be asking the telegraph operators inside, you know, furiously, you know, listening and writing down messages. Can you show me this trick? Can you show me how to do this? And he was making a bit of a pest of himself. And they had no time for him. You know, the, the uh, telegraph ran like 24 seven at this time. And so um, Edison doesn't want to take the reward, but he does say, um, can you teach me some tricks on the telegraph? So Mr. McKenzie looks at this young boy, you know, how old are you? Well, now Edison's 15 years old. Mr. McKenzie said, well, if you go home and you ask your parents and they give permission, you can move in with my family and I will apprentice you. I will train you to be a telegraph operator. At that time, that's probably like writing code for NASA. This is like huge, you know? And it was a great opportunity. And his, his parents, of course, allowed him. So he graduates at the age of 16 as a telegrapher. And he's traveling around the United States um, as an itinerant telegrapher. He's going up to parts of Canada. He's going down south, you know, United States. And he's really plying his trade. I mean, you really had to be um, able to take your machine apart, almost like, with, you know, with a blindfold on, put it back together. So you're learning about the mechanism, um, Everything, though, is it's odd, you know, because it's all uh, audio at that time. You have to listen for the dots and the dashes, you know, and I'm just saying earlier. Um, he's how hearing Edison, impaired. He's hearing impaired, but this comes through clearly. It's the talk in the room of, you know, many other telegraph operators that's actually kind of subdued, and he's not hearing that as well. Wow. Where that would be a problem for others, it wasn't for him. And he gets quite a reputation for having a good hand, they called it. He could take messages very quickly. He's always doing improvements on the telegraph. He finally is traveling all over, and he finally winds up in Boston um, about 1870, I guess it was 1869, 1870. And it's a really tight-knit community of inventors. Um, Edison, of course, is working for the largest employer in the world at that time, Western Union. But he likes the night shift because he likes to 
tinker and make inventions. Mm -hmm. He rents a little shop, a little room in a shop, like a table, um, Charles Williams uh, Jr. shop in Boston. And, you know, other people of the day like Watson, you know, Bell, those people are going there, they're working there. Um, they're buying parts, you know, for their inventions that they're doing. And uh, Edison gets an idea. He gets an idea from a machine called a, a vote recorder. And uh, he didn't ever had the money at the time to get patents, you know, because there was an application fee. It was very expensive for him. And so uh, he has this idea. One of his coworkers had gotten a little money from a, a bequest and he offers to go into business with that and become partners. I'll be the, you know, the money guy and you be the, you know, the brain guy. And Edison creates a vote recorder. So he's thinking this thing is great. It works great. It has a system like, I guess, similar to a telegraph. He's imagining one would be in front of each legislator. And so when voting came along, you would press either, you know, yes or no. It would send a signal along dropping a chemical on a a pre-treated piece of paper and voting would be so quick. Isn't that great? Well, the people running the legislature did not think so. They, why would we want voting to go quicker? We need a filibuster. We need to discuss the issues. You know, I want to pull these people on my side of the aisle. So it's a failure. Mm. 21 years old, his first patent, it's a failure. Edison now is in debt. He owes money. And so he actually borrow some more money, he takes a, tea, a steamship because there's a, a, an offer of a job in New York City and he takes a steamship to New York. Um, it was going to be at the Golden Stock Indicator Company. A good friend of his, Franklin Pope, was the head man there. And Franklin Pope was a very well-known man of his day. He had been a telegrapher. He wrote articles for the Telegraph uh, magazine that, that, that was very popular among all their cohorts. And uh, the problem is, though, by the time Edison shows up, the job is filled. So he feels a little bit bad. So he says, Edison, you can have a cot in the back room until you get yourself situated, you know, find your job. And so, you know, Edison's doing that. But he's really curious about the machines that are in this Golden Stock Indicator Company. So today we would think of, you know, stock ticker. The mm -hmm. machine at that time, though, looked more like kind of a telegraph, if you will. And so Edison's fascinated because it's run by gears. Um, but one of the problems with it is, and, and they're a division of Western Union. One of the problems with this machine is it comes out of synchronization quite a bit. And then, you know, Edison's tinkering around and, you know, just looking at it and going out looking for work. And he comes back one day and the shop is in an uproar. The machine had stopped working. There were literally people out in the streets screaming, you know, what's the price of gold? What's the price of silver? And uh, William Orton, the president of Western Union and this division comes over and, you know, Edison seeing him, uh, his friend Franklin being talked to by this, you know, very important man, you could tell, you know, probably long beard and well-dressed. And uh <laughs> Franklin sees Edison, he tells his assistant, go get him. He cannot figure out what the, how to fix this machine. He needs a pair of fresh eyes on this. And Edison also has a good reputation with machines. So Edison comes over and it's not too long before he you know, circles the machine, he comes back, he sees there's a spring out of place, pushes it back in, oh, he's the hero. And uh, Willie Morton said, hire him. And uh, so they're working together. and. Orton took a real interest in Edison. He'll really become a mentor to him. He sees something in him, you know, just Edison's work, work ethic and how he thinks about things. And he makes him an offer. How about if you work for me on inventions? I'll give you some materials, some men to work with. And I just want first right of refusal on the patent. So, I mean, this is like a dream, you know, come true for Thomas Edison. So he does that. And he's, uh, he's working with Franklin Pope. They'll become partners improving the stock ticker. Because I said, it comes, out of, it comes out of synchronization and time down costs money. So they create what we know today is a universal stock ticker. It's got this unison coil. It's really keeping, it's going to keep the machine running well. So anyway, Edison, he, he and Pope don't know how much to ask for this item. I mean, again, he's like 22 at the time. So they talk about it. I don't know why young Edison is given the job to sell it, but he is. And 
he, they had talked, maybe they get three or four thousand dollars. You know, they're thinking this is great. Well, Edison doesn't know how much to ask for it. And then, you know, some of these stories are stories, but they're interesting. And, you know, we weren't there, but, you know, from different write ups, this is what we find out. Totally. Yeah. So Edison, um, he doesn't know what to ask. So he does the one thing you should never do. He said, how much do you want to pay us for it? So, you know, the men turn around, they're conferring. You can imagine, you know, oh my gosh, you know, they're lucky if they say, how's $10 down, you know, yeah. they come back and they say, I mean, now the dollar amounts, I, I read them. They're different amounts and different, you know, um, you know, uh, books that I read, but say $40,000. Mm. Well, that sounded just fine to Thomas Edison. Mm. That's like three quarters of a million dollars today. So Edison quickly agrees and, and we hear that, you know, in some, some writings about it, it says, oh, Edison was feeling, you know, a little distraught about thinking he took advantage or, or was he bragging when he says something to the effect of, um, gee, we would have accepted a lot less. And, the, and this group comes back and said, oh, Mr. Edison, you did not take advantage of us. We were willing to offer you double that. Yeah. So Thomas Edison's now going to do what he always wanted to do. You know, people have different goals in life. I want to be president. I want to be on television. I want to go to the moon, whatever. He thought there was no greater calling than wanting to be an inventor. Mm. And so he thinks now I don't have to work for anybody anymore. So he's living in New Jersey at the time at actually Franklin Pope's mother. He's renting a room from her in, I believe it was Elizabethtown, New Jersey. It's now known as Elizabeth. And uh, he it opens up a shop in the biz- biggest city in New Jersey, Newark, New Jersey. And he's making, you know, stock tickers. He's making improved uh, telegraph machines, uh, fire alarms, you know, and his brain's moving. He's, he's developing the ideas of where he wants to go in the future. He l- literally writes out a list of things he would like to accomplish, goals. Wow. We should all do that, you know, have your goals. So Thomas Edison is, uh, you know, doing well, but he does have to do some work for other companies because research costs a lot of money. So he's doing some work for Western Union. They're paying him like a, a monthly stipend to do some work for them. And uh, so this is a little off topic, but one day uh, these two young girls were ducking out of the rain. His new partner now, uh, Ask them if they want jobs testing fire alarms. A little unusual women working in a workshop, I guess. But he, uh, you know, that you hear about in history, it's probably not as uncommon as we think today. But um, he notices one of the girls in particular, Mary Stillwell, a a real beauty. And uh, he's not used to talking to young ladies. As I mentioned, his sisters and his brother were, you know, quite a bit older married women really when he's a young boy and uh, he's working in a machine shop culture so it's a lot of men but he finally gets the nerve to speak with her and uh, tells her what a good job she does and shortly thereafter he says how about if we get married next Tuesday for example so that did not go over very well (laughs) I mean she's a young girl he's a young man and so they don't marry right away i'm sure the family her family wanted him to get to know her but they do marry Mm -hmm. um christmas day um, 1871 and they will have three children together um while they're married and they have two children still living in newark edison is getting um uncomfortable with the situation it's he doesn't own the building he's renting um the landlord wants him to sign a lease or some kind of lease problems He's asking people, tell me, look, for, keep your eyes out. I'm looking for a place to go to. So someone told, I think, believe it was his father, Samuel, about a failed housing development on the Pennsylvania Railroad. It has to be close to transportation. There's no cars, right? I mean, there's yeah. no trucks. It's either water, which is what he grew up next to, or it's trains. Mm. And uh, you don't want to do wagons if you can avoid that. <laughs> so he... Uh, comes down and looks at a failed housing development called Menlo Park. Uh, Menlo is actually a Gaelic word that means small pond. And there were a number of little small kettle ponds in the area. We actually still have a pond on our property um, that we're thrilled with and uh, small, but you know, a lot of, a lot of life in it. 
And uh, so Thomas Edison comes along. The only thing really here was a home, which was serving as the business office. Um, Edison buys the house and the land, about 34 acres at that time, for about $5,200, which actually was a pretty good price even then. Uh, the main road that ran down here is called Christie Street, and it's still Christie Street today. I've had some visitors come and tell me that's what they call their workshop, Christie Street, because it's reminiscent of Menlo Park. And uh, Thomas Edison asked his father, Samuel, to oversee. He had, been, he had worked with making, uh, he had a, like a lumber mill, making uh, wooden roof uh, tiles over out in Michigan. And so he asked his father, why I'm in England conducting some research on the transatlantic cable for the telegraph, can you oversee the construction of my laboratory? Mm. So he does. It's all wooden, um, except for, of course, the foundation. And it was 100 foot long, 25 foot wide, two stories. I'm actually looking right where it was uh, at that time. And it was the, uh, it'll be the largest um, laboratory in the world at that time. Very soon thereafter, he's making outbuildings because he don't have enough room. The machine shop, which is much larger than my current museum, was an integral part of the whole process of research and development. He would bring the crew together. He hired engineers, glass blowers, blacksmiths, um, uh, carpenters, machinists, and they all came in together and they would talk and they would... This is the product we have. They had a, a pattern shop where the, the uh, blacksmith would, you know, he would heat up the, you know, molten metal and then pour it into these wooden molds. And well, that's not working. Let's do it this way. I mean, so it's all on top of one another. See, this is so very different than what happened before. Before a lone inventor would be working like in their barn or in their shop, uh, in their basement. And, oh, I need something made out of glass. Oh, let me go get in the queue at the glass blowers, uh, you know, shop or, you know, so your job, everything was slowed down. Sometimes when the momentum slows down, so does the production, the mm -hmm. ideas. So Edison knew he wanted to, he wanted to win. He wanted to you know, get to the finish line. And so he has to pay these people. So he's doing side work again here at Menlo. He'll move in here in March of 1876. He bought the property in 1875. Um, and then they add a glass house. At first, it's got a glass roof. And it's called that because that's where the blueprints are made. Um, and then it becomes where the glass blower Ludwig Bohm, he'd actually live in the eaves above. He didn't get along very well with the other workers here. Um, and then they had the, you know, the carpenter shed and the glass house. They even made a um, blacksmith shop and they made carbon here too, because carbon was really necessary because Edison's filaments are carbon, mm. you know, not solid carbon, but uh, they're, they're, the filaments are coated with carbon. So they actually had the blacksmith, it was his job in the morning to, you know, go in and to the carbon shed and scrape all the black soot out of the um, kerosene lantern glass, you know, structures. And uh, they had young boys that worked here. Well, Edison comes here, as I mentioned, moves in in 1876. He's working on, that's the same year that Bell gets the patent for the telephone. Now, Edison was working on the telephone and other people all over the world. They knew this was an item that was almost there. Bell gets the patent in 1876, but it actually doesn't work very well because the sound transmission is, the quality is very poor. So Edison's working on trying to make it work better and he hears something. Okay, again, the hearing. What is he hearing? Because as, as, as he gets older, his hearing is getting worse. We also think there's a hereditary issue uh, with mastoids potentially with his hearing because his family had been hearing even his son, one of, it, one of his sons. So Thomas Edison, um, but he hears something, he draws up a little diagram and he gives it to John Crusey, his uh, Swiss trained clockmaker machinist, you know, he's a real fine machinist. And he builds what we, uh, well, what Edison told us would be called the phonograph. And so people were, you know, kind of, you know, working and playing around with what does sound look like, but no one thought what does sound hear like again. Mm -hmm. There were other experiments being done, but no, everyone just wanted to see it like as a graph almost. Edison heard this and it, 
he's, you know, it's again, that tone level, different tone level. And uh, he, uh, his, John Cruci does a good job. They actually work really well together. He, Edison also with Charles Batchelor, and then later on um, with um, um, uh, Francis Upton, his physicist. I mean, like really, they keep, they really create these close knit groups. Uh, Clark, I mean, there's just so many really amazing men that work here. Edison only hires, you know, who he thinks are the best people. And so Edison, it's made, he puts a tin foil around it. Not aluminum foil like we have today, but this thick tin, you know, used in experiments. It's got grooves on like, well, one continuous groove. Um, he puts a diaphragm on it. Actually inside the diaphragm, they use um, like mica, very thin rock. So the vibrations can be heard. And uh, Edison puts a, like a stylus or a needle on it. It's got a crank handle. The first time he tries it, it works. He said mm. it kind of scared him because it actually worked. Nothing ever worked the first time. So the first recording he did was, today we do like testing one, two, three. Mary had a little lamb. Its fleece was white as snow. And then he rewound it, you know, put a different diaphragm on. And of course, crackly, we can imagine, uh, but you can hear distinctly what he's saying. And like, mm. it's amazing. And so, that is, that is so moving. Uh, I mean, that for, you, I, you know, when I think about Edison and I, I was doing my research beforehand, uh, I think myself and most people uh, immediately zap to light bulb. Like we think light bulb. Uh, hitting your website, hearing you talk through a, a lot to his journey there. Uh, I, I saw on your website, he had over a thousand patents by the time he passed away, 300 of which were built, created, worked on there in Menlo Park. That is incredible. And uh, the fact that he got a first swing at the auditory side of this with, uh, with hearing deficiencies is it's mind boggling how, how he got to that point. I, I constantly hear this idea of entrepreneurial spirit as you talk through his journey. Uh, he continued to try different things and tinker with things, and he had a couple of failed businesses. Uh, I read online as I was kind of looking at your museum, it's broken into four or five sections. Uh, I'm curious, as you walk through these different themes, these four or five themes that you have in the museum, do you have a specific area that... Uh, inspires you the most that moves you the most I mean I know you've been doing this a while but is there a part that as you get to that area you find yourself getting a bit more wound up or a bit more excited or passionate about or you use the word inspired I'd like to inspire young entrepreneurs is there an area within the museum that you feel most inspired you know it really what inspires me is not giving up mm. like how could this I mean he could have made good money in other fields just producing product. He probably could have made a lot more money, actually. Yeah. But he had such a passion, really, for making lives better. Mm. Um, I'm sure there's ego involved in it also. Um, why wouldn't there be? But that a little ego is not a bad thing. But he really just didn't give up. Yeah. You know, and he just was like, well, all right, this isn't working. Let me try something else. And he researches. This is a man who went to school for less than three months, but never stops learning. It's incredible. It really is because when his um, when his physicist comes here, who has a graduate, the first graduate degree in electricity from Princeton, studies under Helmholtz over in Germany, and and Francis Upton, and he's like blown away by you know by the breadth of knowledge of, that Thomas Edison has, because yeah. he's interested in everything everything yeah of the 1000 patents was there anything uh weird or funky or funny <laughs> or something worth like uh something you set to the side like wow that is really interesting he was he was going way out there for that one well there's so many and you know of course we don't always hear about a lot of the failures you know um well one of his famous failures um is making a talking doll uh, that would be post Menlo uh, Park. 
um, it had a little, I guess, like a telephone, uh, not telephone, excuse me, a, a little uh, phonograph inside. Mm. And I guess it got worn down and then it started screeching and it was scaring children, little girls. So that was definitely a famous failure. Um, there were things that really frustrated him too. You know, he had success really early. I was just talking about the phonograph. It's that item that will make him world famous. Mm. You know, like you said, everyone thinks light bulb, but it's the phonograph that makes him known as the wizard of Menlo Park. People literally thought that he could make a machine talk. Like they didn't understand the science or the concept. I'm not saying everyone, but people were really blown away. Even when he took it to the offices of Scientific American, you know, stolen publication today in New York, they thought that he was playing a trick on them. Mm. How could this machine be talking? And so he had to do a, demo, a, a live demonstration right then and there. Um, but, you know, Thomas Edison worked for years, like after he left here, he actually makes a fortune in batteries. He wants to have electric cars. Now, years ago, I could say there were more electric cars, you know, then than today, of course. I mean, my son has electric car, you know, and everybody has electric car somewhere um, in their family. And uh, so he just really thought so far ahead. I was just somewhere recently and it said, I don't, I don't want, I'm just paraphrasing this quote, but he said, you know, one day we'll be able to, um, instead of go, you know, having surgery and medicines, uh, nutrition will be used to cure a lot of our ills. Like he really thought deeply about so many different subjects and it's just time ran out. I mean, that's really, he yeah. had so many ideas, but time ran out. I mean, he lived a good life. Yeah. As, as you talk through, and I'm keeping an eye on my time, but as you talk through his journey, uh, the number of patents that he had, the, uh, sort of journeys, the adventures that he sort of endured and was willing to go into the number of failures that he took on. Uh, do you, what do you hope or what, what do you feel young entrepreneurs should be taking from this story or from a trip to your museum? I, uh, yes, earlier we talked about this idea of, you know, don't be afraid of failure and just to just keep trying, keep trying. Uh, is there anything else within that, within his journey, within this his story that uh, you hope to echo or relay to those that are pursuing or that are just listening? Yeah, well, Edison has many famous quotes. And one of them, you know, like, oh, he was genius. So he was, you know, somehow far removed from what anybody else could be. But he always said genius is 1% inspiration, 99% perspiration. It's in the hard work. Now, Thomas Edison is asked, you know, probably many times, about, oh, your first patent was a failure. And, you know, he was a little taken aback by that. He's like, what do you mean a failure? Because you know what I learned from this experience? I mean, he'll have the same thing come up when he does that transatlantic um, uh, cable research in uh, 1875, 1876 over in Europe. They had a problem with, um, I think it was a resistance problem. And and that failure actually was something he used later on to a positive effect. So to him, everything was a learning experience. They're not failures. Mm -hmm. And what an amazing way to look at life. Yeah. You know, to me, that is what's inspiring. Yeah, that's beautiful. I, uh, I cannot remember who told this to me. Maybe it was uh, maybe it was a Steve Jobs quote. I cannot remember, but uh, it was something about it's so much easier to connect the dots looking backwards, right? Like as you're trying to build things, it's so hard to understand how does uh, me working on uh, this this phone piece or this telegraph, how does this how does this relay to a light bulb, and how does that relay to work? You know, a team approach on research, it, all these things. Uh, but, once you get there and you turn around and you look back, you start to realize that skill sets and approaches and people and things that you start to carry along that journey with you, right? It's so much easier to connect the dots looking backwards. Um, Ms. Kathleen, for those that have tuned in that uh, they're interested in learning more about maybe you, uh, about the Thomas Edison Center, they just want to continue this sort of learning journey, folks that are local to you and folks that are not, what's the best way to get involved and learn more? 
Well, definitely check out our website. Um, we really appreciate that. We do have a lot of social media that you'll see it on our on our website. Um, every time a visitor will come here, they'll learn something new. I mean, we do a lot. We have a lot of interns. I, I had a young man a few years ago come here just to do something on a Saturday because he loved history. And he went back and got his master's degree in museums. And he works at Sotheby's now in New York. And um, I have another intern who's moving on. Like it's really a, um, it's a creative place for learning about how to uh, inspire others and, uh, you know, to move ahead. I mean, the thing is with this small site, I mean, it, it's difficult because we are in a state park. This is the Edison State Park. Um, it's leased to the township of Edison, which changed its name to Edison in 1954. Thank goodness. Um, and also a nonprofit manages this. So like wearing hats like that, it's a, it's like a skill <laughs> that you have to learn. And, and, uh, and you do have trials and tribulations because you have to work through many different uh, needs of different groups. Um, you know, working for a nonprofit is always rewarding, I think. I mean, I worked in other businesses before, but nonprofits become a passion. And, uh, and I work with a lot of people who have donated time and skills. I have a whole group of people coming this Saturday to help us, you know, work on our trails that we have, our nature trails. I mean, it's a beautiful setting here um, with lots of, you know, native birds and flowers, you know, ferns and fauna. And, uh, you know, if that's something that you want, pursue it. This is one thing I always tell, we used to have, you know, and I hope we'll have it again next year. We have, a, we had 1200 students from one district come, one grade, big, big district in Edison. And, you know, we used to say, find something that you love to do and you'll find a way to make a living at it, mm -hmm. you know, and then you'll be a happy person. Um, it, it took me until I was 50 to find what, I, and I always liked all my jobs, but this is different. This is a passion. You know, so yeah. I encourage people to find their passion. Beautiful. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's funny. There is something about uh, being on site with, with where, where the journey took place and where the action happened. Uh, I think about this trip I took to, to New York City a few months back, a few years back of uh, my first time I was able to visit Rikers Island, right? And get with, uh, it's, you hear about it, you read about it, you listen about it, but then you're on site. And there's a feel to it. There's uh, a movement. It's just so powerful to sort of see the flow of things and see the remnants of what used to be and learn about that. I can't imagine what you feel and the inspiration that folks take from uh, a visit to your location. Uh, let, let me close with this as, I, as a question I jotted down that I'm curious about, but he's invented so much. There's so much out there that you could be engaged with and learn about. Is there anything that you do not have in your museum? that you wish you did, an item out there that you know exists, that it would just be a dream item to have in your museum. Is there anything out there for you? Absolutely. Well, there's a few, but the one that stands out most is an electric pen, mm. which is the forerunner of the tattoo pen. He didn't think of that idea for it. Um, yeah, electric pen. They actually manufactured them here at Menlo Park. We have some remnants from a um, uh, archaeological dig that was done here. We've had uh, three different archaeological digs. Wow. Um, but yes, I would love to have an yeah, electric yeah. pen. We got this stock ticker on loan last, I guess about a year and a half ago. Uh, so that was amazing. And we have amazing, even though we're not a big museum, you're looking at a lathe that Thomas Edison's men worked on here. We have um, his, and one of his eye loops. We have books that he, you know, learned from. I mean, it does, like you said, when you go into a place, people tell us, they come and like, I'm breathing in the air because I wanna get inspiration. It does make a difference. That's why we travel to Egypt and to Rome and exactly. to Greece and all these other places. Yeah. So come visit us here at the uh, Thomas Edison Center at Menlo Park. Definitely, yeah. Kathleen, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, I felt I was prepared coming in and uh, I just learned, I mean, that was, that was incredible. Uh, thank you. Thank you for your time. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah. For those listening, uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please press subscribe on YouTube or on your podcast app. Uh, that connection will show the algorithms that this is an important conversation and more people can have the opportunity to learn about the importance of 
not only Thomas Edison, but how the efforts of one man can truly change the outlook, the trajectory of the entire world.